the most sensitive topic now, which is what is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh since a few weeks, why and what next. And that's really a very difficult topic. And I'm really, really grateful to our four speaker and especially to Mikhail Mamedov to propose to organize that event and to our four speaker to be here to discuss something which is very sensitive as a policy topic, but also as a scholarly one. And I know for each of our four speakers, it's also a personal issue. So I'm very grateful for you to be able to kind of, you know, put the personal elements on the side and try to look at what is happening as scholars and, and try to give us your feedback on this really very difficult situation where we found ourselves now in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. So for, let me very, very, very briefly present our four speaker. You can read their bio more in details on our website. So I don't want to take time in uh, reading that and, and uh, um, spending too much time. We will first hear from Mikhail Mamedov, who is a lecturer at Georgetown University, but also associated at Georgetown, at, uh, sorry, <laughs> associated at George Washington University. Then we will have uh, Nona Sharnazarian, who is at the uh, Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography at the National Academy of Science in Yerevan, and who is a member of our PONAS Eurasia Network. Then we will hear from Ulvi Ismail, who is uh, uh, from based in Northern Virginia, also working on uh, um, Azerbaijan. And then we will hear from Anita um, Khachaturova, who is uh, uh, now at the University Libre of Bruxelles in, in Belgium. So our four speakers, as I said, have both scholarly and kind of personal elements of their life linking them to the Nagorno-Karabakh, and that will be really interesting to have them discussing the, the both the Armenian and, and the Azerbaijani perspective. So I would like to give you the floor now, 10 minutes maximum for each of you. And Mikhail, let's begin with you. The floor is yours. To start, I would like to start looking at the situation in uh, in the region, and I believe uh, if you look at all these uh, four sides of the conflicts, I mean, Arme Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia, Russia, and Turkey, I believe it would be fair to say that there's no 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 not a real, well there is there is one real winner in this conflict, and this real winner is Turkey because Azerbaijan did not really win at this war and Russia lost and Armenia lost. So we have kind of two losers, one side, one side that did not really want this conflict and eventually will fill itself as, also as a loser. And there's only one big winner in this war and this is Turkey. I would try to explain my points, my, my position, my arguments. Well, first of all, Azerbaijan today is celebrating victory. Aliyev staged this bombastic, uh, glorious, magnificent parade. And But his idea, uh, Karabakh Bizimder, Karabakh is ours, it pretty much resembled what Putin is saying, Crimea is ours, Krim is Nash. And indeed, uh, well, Aliyev indeed managed to return seven regions which were lost during the first Karabakh war of 1992-1994. Opposition is silence. Had he decided to run free, free, absolutely free election, he would have definitely won them. But on the other hand, if even if you search YouTube, uh, you would see some demonstrations uh, that were rallied right, right after this right after this agreement was was signed and some people were waving actually waving turkey well turkish azeri pakistani and even ukrainian flags i know arsen Avakov probably would have been very unhappy to see ukrainian flag over there and they were saying why we why we why did we sign this agreement why we did not go further why we did not take the whole territory karabakh is ours why we did not capture stepanakir and that's what eventually put him in a very tough position because when situation in the Republic would deteriorate, if prices of oil will fell, I mean, prices of oil today are, uh, are very low, well, considerably low than they used to be a few years, a couple of years ago, uh, he would feel, uh, this regime will feel very, very unsafe inside of the Republic. Also, we'll see emergence of new 
uh, new uh, new generation of war veterans who one day will be will decide to play their own role in the in, in political life of the countries. And also what is very important, if Russians entered any region, it would be very hard to ask them to leave, especially in the case of Karabakh, uh, the uh, attitude of Europe would be attitude of the West would be quite different because uh, unlike in case of Ukraine, unlike in the case of Georgia, where the West is pressuring the press is really pressing Russians to leave, in the case of Karabakh, the reaction would be different. Uh, Ali would not receive the same support from the West as he probably hopes to. Now, what about Russia? Russians also lost in this war. They definitely lost this war because uh, Putin is being criticized not only by his opponents, but even by his own uh, home, by his by, by his own people. That's one of his own member of his own party, Konstantin Zatulin, a member of the United Russia Party, I almost said United Nations, United Russia Party. He criticized Putin for not uh, interfering on Armenian side very actively. He said, uh, Zatulin said, we should make up our we should make up our mind. We should either we support the right of self-determination determination or not. Well, Zatulin said that Russia should have sent troops to assist Karabakh. But again, as Alexander Eskenderian said, uh, you know, which is, there are certain differences between Russia's obligation to Armenia as a country, and but there is no obligations to some kind of Armenian community living in some different areas, like area of Karabakh. And uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, criticism, a lot of theories, uh, especially by some Western scholars, by and some Western and even some Armenian scholars that Russia switched sides, Russia signed special agreement with Turkey. Now we will see emergence of new alliance, Russia, Azerbaijan, Turkey. Well, Jirair Liberidian, one of the most prominent uh, people in this area, he said Russians betrayed Armenia. Russia is now wants Turkey to be her ally, Turkey and Azerbaijan. But if you look, well, first of all, if you look at the History, you know, we know that Russians fought with Turkey nearly 13 wars, 13 wars. And Russia has a lot of issues with Turkey. Russians has issues with Turkey in Syria. They have issues with Turkey in Libya. And today, Russians have uh, Russia. Well, there is, there, is, there is no doubt there are extremists. There are Syrian extremists, serious Muslim radicals in the South Caucasus. And one day they might penetrate, they might infiltrate North Caucasus, and they might uh, get even get, get even infiltrate Southern Russia. Another point which Jair Lebaridian made was that Russia needs Turkey to be some kind of disrupting factor inside of NATO. And that's I'm surprised that such a serious scholar made such a argument because Turkey is, dis is, a, is disturbing Europe by themselves. I don't have to remind everyone what uh, uh, Erdogan said to the French president Emmanuel Macron. You, we know that. I, 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 don't, I don't have to remind you about this. So uh, I don't believe in Russia's Turkey alliance. Of course, Russians need Turkey to sell, uh, to send oil to Europe for South Stream. But nevertheless, uh, Russians suffered from some kind of humiliation from Turkey in this war. Now, Armenia, of course, Armenians lost in this war. They lost seven regions, which were, but, but these seven regions were indeed occupied, and no, nobody, I believe, nobody should have seriously expected that this region, regions Armenia would be able to keep forever. And, uh, well, there are some scholars had said that, uh, you know, there are seven regions and nobody, uh, again, I'm repeating myself. One of the Armenian experts said that this war was presented as liberation. So Armenia liberated this uh, region, liberated from whom? It's a big question. Now, uh, well, Thomas Duval, uh, the famous, probably most famous expert in this area, he said that when the war started, before the eve of this war, Armenian, new Armenian leadership, they made a lot of very provocative statements, such as, well, you know, uh, 
new, new prime minister uh, of Armenia, new leader of Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, he said that uh, Karabakh is ours, period, and uh, minister of the new minister of defense of Armenia, David Tonayan, he said that the idea that peace in exchange of recognition is no longer an option. He said that uh, while he was meeting uh, members of Armenian diaspora in New York. So that's where very provocative things, very provocative statements. And also what was provo another provocation was that uh, Karabakh parliament, parliament of this de facto state, not recognized, Republic, they moved their sessions from Stepanakert to Shusha, and that was also a big uh, insult for the for Azerbaijan. Uh, and well, the consequences were, of course, the war of uh, that started on September 27. Well, again, there are some conspiracy theories in Armenia, and also some conspiracy theories that articulated by. Russian mass media, especially by Armenian-controlled Russian mass media, that Pashinyan came in order to sell Karabakh. So Pashinyan sells Karabakh, and after that, uh, after that, uh, these countries like Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, they all are able to integrate to NATO. But uh, because uh, membership of the members of NATO, are, I presume, they're not supposed to have territorial uh, problems between each other. But if we look just at numbers, if we look at numbers, we see that, well, uh, Azerbaijan has a population of Azerbaijan is slightly above 10 million, 10 million people, and a population of Armenia is a little bit under 3, under 3 million people. And uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijani GDP, GDP is uh, around 47 billion people, Armenian GDP is around 12.5 uh, billion dollars. Azeri military budget is two billion uh, uh, two hundred sixty-seven billion two billion two hundred sixty-seven million dollars, and Armenian military budget is just four hundred thirty-four million dollars. And again, Russia's uh, obligations uh, to to a member of Armenia CSTO they generally cover well, they basically cover only uh, Armenia as the Armenian Republic. They are not they are not. Uh, can they not cover uh, Karabakh? It's about country. We should we should distinguish between country and ethnic Armenians. So that's uh, that is explainable what what happened. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, but thank you for thank you for thank you for for the opportunity to give this presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation, and I now would like to give the. That any country that faces defeat, uh, it, any defeat gives a, gives a lot of rise to different speculations. There is a famous <laughs> phrase, uh, defeat, ha uh, victory has a lot of fathers, but defeat is always an orphan. <laughs> That's exactly right. I know we you now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for for this opportunity to be part of this round table and I, i'm i'm going to talk about um, uh, human rights in nagorno karabakh uh, and uh, i argue that the nagorno karabakh conflict has different drivers and motivations for azerbaijani and armenians namely azerbaijanis look at nagorno karabakh as a significant territory the concept of Torpach, native soil, as a discursive priority, and Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh fighting is a struggle for self-determination that emerged in the face of pogroms and ethnic cleansings and became over the time a struggle for survival. Uh, American anthropologist Nora Dadwick analyzed these uh, discourses and came to the same conclusion that Nagorno-Karabakh uh, as a part of Azerbaijani identity is very important and si signified uh, part, um, though completely attached to the concept of uh, territory. If we remember Tobkhana and Shushi and, and um, many, many um, attachment to the places like that. Well, Armenians articulate the concept of homeland uh, uh, in a primordial way, emphasizing people's identity and lineage. Um, 
uh, uh, if we take this issue in ret in in retrospect uh, in uh, uh, retrospectives, uh, so we can say that as many historians and geographers may know the borders. Uh, between Soviet republics in, in USSR were drawn uh, sporadically and inconsistently, and the process had very prompt and, and accidental character as the central idea was to mix the nationalities in a melting pot of Soviet Union and to create a new type of person, Soviet Soviet. Soviet uh, person. The early Soviet affirmative action policy was centered on the struggle uh, with the great Russian chauvinism, Velikarus chauvinism, rather than with the elites of um, small nationalities on the peripheries of the USSR. As a result, the policy of nativization in Russian Karinizatsa led to the creation of national elites. Uh, in some instances, even uh, artificially constructing them in the places where they virtually never existed, like in Central Asia, let's say. The issue of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh actually undermined um, the whole Soviet doctrine on uh, people's friendship, though Armenians and Azeris in Karabakh uh, used to live well on the grassroots level, uh, and still, the retrospect, uh, and still the retrospective uh, shows that under the Soviet internationalism, they camouflaged or silenced some deep structural problems and resentments. Because of the Soviet uh, centralism in the regulations of social relationships between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijanis, uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis, uh, Complaint and grievances were reported to Moscow rather than to Baku. There were at least some petitions signed by many intellectuals and other notable people who were brave enough to risk their careers so, so as to let Moscow know that the Armenian ethnic minority in Azerbaijan is uh, actually discriminated. I want to focus here on a specific case that, in my view, is a perfect manifestation of the state-sponsored ethnic discrimination on, be on behalf of Soviet Azerbaijan with regard to its Armenian minority. This case is um, particularly interesting as um, it served as a powerful trigger for the Armenian petitions with all the risks they involved um, for initiators. Uh, by the way, ironically, I, I learned about this case um, back in, in 2009, uh, reading um, a, a book of um, the, um, Alexeyeva, Ludmila Alexeyeva, Historia uh, Inakamyslia of SSSR. This is a case of the killing of Sam a nine-year-old boy, the son of Binyamin Benik, by the director of the school in Kurapatkina, uh, Arshad Mamedov. The locals remember vividly the search of the boy in the outskirts of the town with, with mashallah, which is um, torches. When the dead body was found, Benik announced that Arshad Mamedov, his close Azerbaijani friend, killed his son, and they were in Kirva relationship, which is a very difficult um, phenomenon uh, right now to explain, but hopefully one, one day I will. Arshad, uh, um, together with his two uh, acolytes, the security guard Alam Shadin and the lorry driver Zahrab, were arrested on the third day after Nelson's body was found. The trial case was initiated in March 1967. The Armenian lawyers were replaced by Azerbaijanis, and the judge Razakov uh, was sent uh, was a lesbian sent from Baku. Armenians uh, were um, expecting that the highest measure of punishment, like death penalty, uh, uh, 
uh, would be will be applied to uh, Arshad and his two helpers. The wife of the killer was in hysteria, saying in the uh, in the uh, during the trial that she will sell all her gold to free her husband from the prison. In an extremely tense atmosphere, the judge Razakov announced the verdict of 15 years of prison for Arshad Mamedov, 12 years for Alamshad, and while Zohrab could be released immediately. For the Armenians, such a verdict was uh, equivalent to impunity. They believed that in Bakuvian prisons, the killer of an Armenian will be welcomed as a national hero. Uh, and uh, outraged at the verdict, the Armenians um, present at the trial burst in anger and, and killed the three Azerbaijanis. At night, the first secretary of Communist Party of Azerbaijan, SSR, um, Akhundov, and other big shots from Baku arrived. Ashad Mamedov was eventually pompously buried in his uh, native village, uh, Rizhala, or uh, today we uh, this is a different name, and making it an openly anti Armenian action. Witnesses report that the Azerbaijani officials, in order to calm their villagers, made hostile and provocative statements for the loss of our three sons. Three thousands of, their, of theirs will have to pay. We know how to avenge them, was, was heard at the burial ceremony. This was an emergency so now case. Now you have only two minutes left. Sure, sure. This was... Uh, an emergency case in the Soviet routine, and people from Moscow arrived on the next day. The closest relative of the assassinated boy were imprisoned in Baku and were heavily tortured. After 12 years in Baku prison, Benik Movsisyan, the father, went back to his village and died within a year. So, um, the case showed the degree of tension between the Armenian and uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis and the dominant attitude of the latter towards the Armenians in the Soviet recomposition of power relations uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh um, Autonomous Oblast. This example lays into the background of the tense atmosphere at the heart of ethnic relations within the Soviet Azerbaijan, which laid ground for the new Perestroika time petition presented to the Kremlin in 1988. The long, longitudinal research on the analysis of the Karabakh movement, uh, movement posters carried out by Harutun Marutian showed how the articulation of the uh, demands aimed at justice um, for the Armenians of Karabakh, rather than a mere territorial claim. The grassroots answer of some part of Azerbaijani society was violence and pogroms against Armenians in Azerbaijan, and especially in Sumgayit, Kirabat, uh, and Baku. Uh, the 2020 war revealed how the initial struggle of Armenians for human rights has been concealed by tactics of false equivalence and manipulated co causal relations. With the help of the contemporary fake news industry, there has been a complete decontextualization of the problem of ethnic relations in the Soviet Union, and the reading has been made only through the prism of modern day geopolitical realities. The in insistence of territorial integrity as the sole guarantor of international security and stability undermines um, initial human rights demands uh, and reinforces authoritarian discourses detrimental for both the, the people of Armenia and Azerbaijan. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry if I abused the time. Thank you very much, Nona, for this prospective um, time. Now, we'd like to give the floor to Ulvi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, 
the outcome of this uh, some of the war uh, somehow reminds me um, uh, the last years of um, USSR, a situation when in 1988-91, uh, uh, when at least more than a year, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh's management um, was handed over from Baku to Moscow uh, without changing uh, the status of the autonomy um, with Azerbaijan. So now, just like then, we have um, more or less control around Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but uh, within so, so four regions uh, that remain uh, uh, by Russia um, um, peacekeepers, uh, at least officially recognized by Moscow, uh, New Moscow, as part of Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan does not have a control of the area and cannot go in when it wants. Uh, we don't see Azerbaijan's name there, administrative management managers, uh, flags, etc. Uh, there's still self-declared self-governance uh, there, um, uh, and being of a uh, member of Azerbaijan is not mentioned there, at least internally. Um, I would like to um, maybe uh, articulate on my friend Mikhail's uh, comments about winner and loser uh, question here. Uh, it's not easy, I think, uh, to say one side is a winner, as my colleague says. Uh, I wouldn't put countries here, especially uh, as a nation, when we talk about uh, winning. Uh, even or especially Turkey. Uh, did people uh, of Turkey win from this uh, conflict, from this war? Um, the public has been in general against Turkey's involvement. I mean, Turkish public has been against in Turkey's involvement in regional conflicts, and Nagorno-Karabakh is definitely one of them. Yes, there is ethnic kinship sympathy uh, for Azerbaijanis in Turkey, uh, but at the end of the day, they have to care for their country, for the economy, and Turkey has been much has not been much involved. Uh, now in this war, as it is involved in other regional conflicts, uh, uh, Turkey has been. There's no death uh, from military of Turkish side. Um, maybe sending some command here. Um, uh, Turkey has also gained financially in this war uh, by selling drones and popularizing them for Azerbaijan's armies videos. Um, but so did Israel. Uh, do we put Israel as a winner of this conflict? And Israel uh, even politically supported um, Azerbaijan in this war. Uh, Turkey is a democracy. Uh, more or less compared to other countries we discuss, uh, Erdogan may not be the next president of the Turkey uh, in three years or so. So did people of Azerbaijan win uh, from this war? Uh, partially, yes. The territories longed for decades are back. Uh, we're at the cost of many deaths. I mean, we have, uh, uh, so I disagree here with my colleague, Nona, that it's only territorial problem for Azerbaijan. Is there were at least uh, 570 um, thousand uprooted people from around Karabakh and Shusha and in some parts of Nagorno-Karabakh inside, you know, internally. Uh, half a million uh, people, now they have grown by size in the last 25 years, it's 700,000, as I say, uh, who have no native land. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, very, it's a more, very important thing in the Caucasus. Uh, people here from this region are known uh, to take their dead relatives wherever they died and take them back to bury in the village they were born or where they descend from. So territory-wise, I think we're both same. Uh, there is no uh, territorial uh, uh, meaning of this uh, for Azerbaijan. Yes, but it's also human. Uh, there are people from that region that were occupied and people were uprooted uh, uh, for ethnic cleansing. Um, now, except uh, two or three uh, uh, of those regions that are returned to Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan gained by military activities, are looted, are looted to the ground. Uh, but Armenian side, you know, all towns and villages are all gone. To restore anything meaningful, uh, there will take decades um, uh, for people to go back. Um, did Armenia, people of Armenia lose, of course, a huge human loss. Uh, they also declare about 3,000 loss. Azerbaijan has declared recently about 3,000 um, uh, loss, losses, military losses. Uh, but when you look at the territories, uh, it still has access to those four territories inside Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, controlled by Russians. Uh, it's uh, still more or better for Armenia than 1992, uh, where Armenia started uh, this in 1992, the war with Azerbaijan over this territory. So, um, but I agree that the leaders of Azerbaijan, Russia, and Turkey definitely are winners, unconditional winners in this war, both for internal politics and for international politics. Uh, and that's what I've said from the first days. 
Um, but if we want to see who held Azerbaijan most and who all it owes to, then we have to wait and see Azerbaijan's next steps. Does it integrate into EU and NATO, where Turkey is a member, uh, or Russia's ODKB or Eurasian Economic Union? So we will see in the um, in the coming maybe months or year. Um, what new or non um, oil investors come to Azerbaijan? Uh, Russian or Turkish ones or European American ones? Because Azerbaijan definitely needs money to resource these areas. And uh, oil prices and COVID-19 situation does not allow us to do that with, uh, you know, it, it's it, the money that will be needed uh, for those areas uh, can not only depend on Azerbaijan's oil-based economy. Uh, it needs a good economy, investors. For that, it needs a rule of law working properly. Democracy, will they be insured? I think why question should be reviewed separately from why now. Because um, those who excluded such possibilities said Azerbaijan lost war in 1994 and they did not know how to fight. This was some stigma or some uh, stereotypes, uh, predominantly Armenian side or those sides who favored Armenia's role in this war. Uh, Ilham Aliyev will never go to full scale war, and this is a quotation because he's not a hawk, or it's, uh, it's bad for the country's economy which he cares the most. Um, Nagorno-Karabakh's defense is too strong uh, to be beaten up by Azerbaijan, both man-made and natural. All heights were controlled by Armenians before this latest war. If ever, then it will be very high human cost uh, for Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan will not be allowed to do so uh, by world power powers, including Russia. But for the majority of top experts uh, in this war, uh, so this war was not a surprise. Uh, there were many sides who said that uh, this war is coming, uh, and they were the top experts who would say this. Uh, unresolved conflict for another 30 years, uh, people uh, and state of Azerbaijan is a loser, was a loser in this situation, and international law was on side, not international law, all the maps, all the international you know, organizations Azerbaijan joined. Uh, Azerbaijan is gaining oil wealth and spending on its army. Uh, Azerbaijan has made advances and tested water in 2016, April war. Ilham Aliyev has been harsh on any projects uh, that saw Armenia as beneficiary, including opening off borders to Turkey, Armenia, Geneva Protocols. Uh, today, many think uh, Turkey and Erdogan has always been anti Armenia, but Tur Erdogan's Turkey wanted to improve relations with Armenia, wanted to smooth up, you know, there's football diplomacy. Uh, we all have seen that. Uh, but it was Ilham Aliyev who changed that. He was uh, said clearly that if Arme if Turkey goes ahead with this plan, Azerbaijan will stop relations with Turkey. So if Turkey chose Azerbaijan of Armenia. So that has to be uh, given the success of, of Ilham Aliyev in this war, uh, for preparing for this war. Um, uh, he did not, Ilham Aliyev did not believe that opening uh, Turkish borders will uh, lessen Armenia's dependency on Russia and uh, smoothen its stance on Nagorno-Karabakh with really Azerbaijan. Uh, and definitely there were Pashinyan's provocations, uh, both on Turkey and Azerbaijan, Armenian politicians, talking about the uh, importance of Ser Serbs' argument, uh, Pashinyan's uh, Karabakh's Armenia statement, attending inauguration, talks about moving the capital to, um, of unrecognized uh, and, uh, nagorno karabakh Republic to Shusha, partly the parliament would be based there, and Pashinyan's wife joining the uh, women battalion and taking pictures of uh, that. Uh, and lastly, the COVID pandemic soon coming to end uh, Trump era, because I think it was predictable that Trump um, was the president of the US uh, and has a strong, is a one member of the culture. Um, um, and, uh, you know, Trump is always America first. So he did not care much for international politics, and except maybe Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, the condition and outcome of the war definitely, uh, Ilham Aliyev, I believe, needed more uh, guarantees uh, from all sides when he went to this war. So that's that's a that's a question, um, and it it it's it's see now it's it's answered. Uh, it was I think Azerbaijan's war at the end. It wasn't um, um, you know role, role of Russia and Turkey is secondary here. If Ali Ilham Aliyev or people of Azerbaijan did not want this war, no external power could impose it on Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan gave a high price on this uh, 200, uh, 2830 officers and soldiers killed and uh, have been announced uh, uh, dead in this war and names are published. If they're missing, I'm sure they will come up. Uh, people of Azerbaijan are divided uh, after this war. Some are angry that Russian army is there and because the Russian as a core of this problem that started in 88. 
and they think that Russia can escalate this problem once again if Azerbaijan tries to kick, kick out the Russia, Russians out of the Azerbaijan and occupy those territories again. Uh, that was lost in 92, so Azerbaijan will lose territories again. So that's what, those what people think. Um, something, um, yeah, this happened in 92, 94, we know that. Um, because of Azerbaijan president, uh, uh, at that time, El Chibay kicked out Russian troops. Azerbaijani public and experts believe that uh, that's what was the reason of Azerbaijan's losing 15% territory, uh, that Azerbaijan could not have occupied so much territory on its own. Um, the other part of if, this- If uh, you can conclude, we'll be yes, already. I will, yes, I am, I am already. Um, I think uh, Azerbaijan uh, might still need our OST means group because the status issue is not solved. And I don't think Ilham Aliyev uh, he was very harsh on uh, with with those uh, co-chairs on the other day. Yesterday, I think was a meeting. The video can be seen. But I think at the end we need that. Finally, ethnic conflict between two nations. It's true that both lived together for centuries. Sometimes in tiny villages in those areas, there are fight that's where fight happened. Uh, we know that when USSR was established, two nations uh, in 1992 as part of one nation, one country in 1920. Uh, Russia was quick to help them forget hostilities and memories about massacres of each you know, mutual massacres, and people in quickly forgot about that in in, in ten years. Uh, but there was only three years of conflict: 1905, 1908, 1920, where people fought with each other, and and then even not everywhere, small parts. It wasn't. It was very chaotic. Now we have 30 years of conflict, war, uh, plus graphic images, the war, you know, of the war. And uh, I don't know if Russia or Turkey will help or any other country will help us to forget this hostility and move back to normal and start uh, living as neighbors um, and, and, and trade and have good, good relations, at least normal relations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ulvi, for your presentation. And I now would like to give the floor to Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, no. Uh, so, as I have been in Armenia for more than two months now, uh, observing the, the war atmosphere and the, the post ceasefire period, I would like if you allow me to talk about the internal dynamics unfolding inside of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Not that the geopolitical aspects are not important, but I feel like what is going on within the Armenian and Karabakh societies uh, right now is generally neglected, uh, while in my view there are very important developments going on and that are worth being analyzed as they could lead to important transformations for Armenia and uh, for the wider region. Um, my research topic is about emotions and affective experience in the context of the Karabakh war. In other words, uh, what I'm interested in is how people actually live war what their complex experiences of the war in terms of emotional, biographical and social dimensions tell us about their dispositions to perpetuate the war or to compromise and uh, reconcile. As the war broke out uh, on the 27th of September, many things in the organization of my field work had to change. Um, namely, I could neither carry out my research inside of Nagorno-Karabakh as I had planned, uh, moreover, now the Hadrut region, where I was supposed to spend most of my fieldwork, is inaccessible altogether, at least for me. And uh, the mere talk of peace and reflection on peaceful coexistence uh, with the Karabakh Armenians in the face of them being bombed and killed seemed to be jeopardized for some time ahead as well. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to expand on my observations from Armenia and based on interviews with Karabakh refugees, give some preliminary hypotheses on how the situation of war and defeat influences the Armenian society. First, let me give you briefly some theoretical premises on how I analyze the material that I gather. So in my understanding of affective experiences, I draw a distinction between emotional discourse uh, be it political, ideological, religious, uh, and so on, that does influence indeed and shape social meanings and identities, and the affective experience, which is never completely captured by the discourse. 
and the excesses of which are revealed in bodily, emotional, and often unconscious phenomena. So discourse is structured and political, while experience is chaotic and diverse. So to give an example, the discourse framed in the way as to convey the fear of extermination appeals to people's social beliefs, collective emotions and experiences that lead people to unify in the face of perceived threat, which is a sort of instrumental function of that, that emotional discourse. On the other hand, the way people actually feel, experience that fear is much more diverse than the discursive structuring thereof. It is situational, both collective and individual, and it is dependent on a variety of dimensions that are not readily observable. So fear conveyed by the same discursive frame is differently felt by a Karabakhti, by an inhabitant of Yerevan, and even more differently so by a diaspora Armenian. It is also circulating and contagious. So depending on the situation in which one finds herself, it will be collectively processed and might create bottom-up dynamics that can eventually transform the social reality and by the same token, the political discourse. So what have I observed? Um, so as I arrived in Yerevan on October 11, I could see many signs and inscriptions on the ground as uh, you walked in the streets or on walls around you on screens that were broadcasting raw propaganda and messages. Um, the, the expression, uh, we will win uh, in Armenian, uh, you could see it all around. Um, it was uh, as well broadcasted by official sources, by authorities, but also by random people. Uh, so on tags, in walls, etc. Uh, random people, vendors, taxi drivers would tell me how resilient the Karabakh people were, those who were, who were staying in shelters while their um, sons, uh, brothers, fathers were at the front line fighting. So they were claiming that they were so, there was no panicking, no chaos or marauding. Um, and this, this was, of course, a very idealized discourse on what was on the reality that was happening on the ground, which was, of course, much more complex. And so, so this discourse was kind of uh, instrumental in, in conveying a feeling of, of pride and, and patriotism. So there was, of course, an atmosphere of grief and pain as well. And I noticed so long lists of names of young dead soldiers uh, inside of churches and also many people praying in churches. Many people also felt lost and abandoned uh, by Russia, uh, their main ally, and by Europe. Um, but the discourse on the bravery of the soldiers fighting alone against the oil-rich Azerbaijan by, by, backed by Turkish NATO forces and uh, Islamist terrorists uh, reinforced patriotic feelings and the belief that the Armenians could not possibly lose. Um, at the same time, I also witnessed the demonstrations organized in Yerevan by Karabakh refugees. In one of the, in one of these, I have been struck by a scene of a boy, maybe a nine or ten years year old boy, who is shouting and crying in front of the UN office. So the representatives of the UN office um, who were behind closed doors, but so he was asking them to to come out. And what he was shouting is basically that before they do something, uh, before you do something, we're all going to die. And so I have been told by one of the demonstrators that the boy had just lost his father in the war. Uh, one of uh, the refugees from Hadrut, uh, whom I interviewed, also told me that she lost her house for the second time in her life. The first time when she, she was was when she was uh, 24 in Baku. The second time uh, now, as she is 56, uh, she could not even take family photos or the diary she's been piling up for her daughter for 20 years. So she left without anything, living behind her father's grave. She nonetheless blamed the Karabakh and Armenian governments for all her misfortunes. She herself is a veteran of the 90s war, and she many times expressed regret for having left her house during this war. She barely escaped, actually, when the Azerbaijani diversion groups entered the town. And when I asked her, weren't you afraid of being out and killed? Actually, one of the, one, one of the men that was killed and filmed on videos that was circulating 
um, some time um, earlier was one of the, the old man um, was actually her one of her um, her friend's relative that, so she knew him very well so I asked her well, weren't you yourself uh, um, afraid of being killed and she said no can you imagine no I was not afraid and she was actually outraged at how many young Armenian boys were walking freely around Yerevan while her hometown was being destroyed. So after the signing of the agreement, uh, there was, of course, an atmosphere of emotional chaos, and nobody was obviously prepared for such an outcome. Uh, as Ulvi referred uh, to, uh, to that kind of uh, discourse, and Myth of the of the war that followed the ninety four um, uh, victory of Armenia. That discourse was very much circulating for for thirty years almost, and so the information broadcasted by the officials during the whole war crumbled altogether, and the, the political discourse. Uh, so all of a sudden, the reality has felt so the one of loss of defeat of destruction of complete unpreparedness and political accountability departed completely from the discourse that has been consistently reproduced for 26 years uh, following the Armenian military victory of 94. So the affective, the bodily reactions to these highly traumatic events uh, depart from the ordinary political discourse. This is what Vivas, um, an anthropologist, uh, specialists on the, the, the Indian-Pakistani conflict. Or uh, of digging out the graves of their relatives or taking, talking, uh, taking out the ancient Armenian cross stones uh, from the walls of the Dadivank Monastery, which is one of the most symbolic Armenian religious sites, they are all testimonies to that split from the ordinary, from that political discourse. Doing that, the person experiences an absence of meaning, a failure of language, and their the embodiment of that excess of experience, not captured anymore by dominant political discourse. So my Preliminary thoughts, emotional chaos, and uh, discursive void is that there is space now uh, in the Armenian and Karabakh societies to create new meanings, new emotional structures. Of course, political instrumentalization can and will eventually take hold of the situation um, and direct the emotional energy towards some political goals but potentialities of bottom-up processes exist and could present overtures for conflict transformation and a reshaping of discursive realities. So the reshaping could certainly lead towards a more conflictual stance and a strengthening of nationalistic sentiments, especially it, it depends, Anita, uh, of course, on the... Uh, yes, uh, just 30 seconds. <laughs> So it, 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 it will, of course, depend on, on the reactions of, um, of the winners, so Azerbaijan, of Turkey, and, um, and on many other dimensions. Uh, but um, it could also restructure past myths and illusions and create opportunities for peace and reconciliation. And I would like to believe that the latter will, will have greater probability to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Thank you all of you for this presentation. We now have some time for question. We plan for only a one hour uh, seminar, so we would have only 10 minutes, but I know many of you are ready to stay longer to continue the conversation if we have more questions, and there are already several arriving in the chat box. Uh, one of the first we are uh, uh, having is from uh, uh, Richard Ogland asking uh, at the former Minsk Group co-chair, he would like to ask if you think Russia would allow the Minsk group to provide observer on the ground. 
And in fact, I asked a question about the role of, of Russia uh, on the ground, but I would like to begin with this question about Russia allowing or not the Minsk groups to provide observer on the ground. Uh, who would like to take that uh, question? Ulvi, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I can quickly answer. I mean, uh, some would say um, Russia would be um, willing to take this um, uh, role on its own now, since it is um, uh, uh, in the ground and can take it further. But Russia needs international institutions. Russia is a part of Odyssey. Russia is part of the Minsk group. So I think for him and, uh, and, and Putin has said uh, that, that the status of the Karabakh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of future. So I think uh, we are in a situation when uh, we're going step by step, uh, the old term step by step uh, uh, plan and the turtles are occupied and the question of Nagorno-Karabakh is a matter of future. So to mitigate that Russia cannot do it on its own, my guess is that, you know, OEC will come back and will, uh, you know, because we have to solve these issues. You know, there are approved people now from Karabakh, uh, as uh, Anita said, but there were same approved people from Azerbaijan in before. So we very familiar situation. Fairly, uh, uh, will those people want to come back to live with Azerbaijan? So you need some kind of leverage from international institutions. It can be taken by country, Turkey or Russia. So my guess is that Minsk will, Minsk will come back. Thank you. Do we have anyone else wanted to answer to that question also, or do I move to another one? I can, I can only add, I agree. I think Russians will support the Minsk group. Not only support, they will only share some responsibility with someone. I saw some publications in uh, that Russians need support and Russians need share responsibility. And I believe members of the group, they were in Baku a couple of days ago, even so as I was not very uh, excited talking to them. It was very, very tough speaking to them. Uh, but they were visiting, uh, even so the system negotiations were not going very well. Great, uh, thank you. We, we have another question about um, the kind of transformation of the conflict from an ethnic conflict to a kind of great power politics now that we have Russia on the ground and Turkey. How do you think the fact that the conflict has been or is being seen more and more through the prisms of the Russia-Turkey relation. Do you think it's kind of shifting the balance to a more great power politics? Can it bring help for solving the conflict or can it can in, in fact make it worse because it would be taken into the, the general frame of the, the Turkish-Russian, uh, the Russian-Turkish relations globally? Would like to answer to that question. No, no, no. I can try. Yes. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I think this is um, really well observed and I, I can see the same tendency that from regional conflict, uh, see how it become uh, global. And um, uh, it seems to me like that both um, or three actors of this conflict are uh, extremely subjectivized uh, because of uh, these two great powers are now in. And it looks like and these three actors are not so important and this uh, Turkey and Russia, they are trying to resolve their um, own problem and relationships. And in that sense, it seems to me that the um, real resolving of this question is not uh, of interest of any big power in this case, because they need this conflict so that to manipulate all three parties. Thank you, Nona. Do we have other perspective on that question? If not, then so there was another question about the ceasefire itself and the line of delimitation that is kind of uh, very blurry in terms of ceasefire. So do you think there is a risk of a, a new conflict emerging or having tensions very regularly that could escalate into a new conflict? 
given the blurriness of the CCR conditions? Well, as far as there are Russians true, for the moment, for the moment, there will be no dangerous for the, of the new real war, but periodic skirmishes will be there on the border between Armenia and I believe there's, there will be new, some kind of small fighting for between Armenia and Azeri uh, groups on the borderland, on the, on the lines of contact, contact. Yeah, yeah. there's already uh, fighting taking place, there were, I think, for uh, Azeri skilled recently. Um, and there was fighting going in the small village of Adrut, which was a siege. Uh, it was Armenian troops remaining there, but it was you know, basically circled everywhere. And I think there was fighting around that. There, of course, there will be guerrilla wars because the, the borders are now so close to each other. There's still unliberated uh, villages of Zangilan and Gubadli regions, which was not mentioned in the agreement but the army did not finish liberating them. So, uh, and some of them are apparently still under Armenian control. So there are a lot of unresolved issues there on the ground. And yes, it looks like dangerous. Uh, my guess is that Russia may want to break up, increase its military force in the region. That may be another reason why this are still happening. But it's it's clear the two, two parts are not happy with the outcome and they, they might continue more to fight. Thank you. And we had uh, maybe the one last question about the Armenians currently staying in as the Azerbaijani controlled part of Nagorno-Karabakh. What can they expect? Will they be obliged to return to Armenia or how will they manage to live in, in now Azerbaijani controlled uh, region? What do you think is their future? Who would like to answer on that question? Greatest question. I guess it depends on them, of course, but uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion of this question because if they leave, uh, most likely they will they will stay, but because there's a Russian troop over there and Hakobian, I think it's what was his first name, uh, he was commanding on this issue at Civil Net, uh, this Armenian. Uh, uh, site that is uh, excuse me Tatu, Tatu. Kakaban, yes uh, as far as they are there they hopefully will stay because if they leave there will be no need for the Russian troops in the region so on, on the other hand Russia would lose the legitimate reason to be in this in the area and that would undermine Russia's uh, role in the area so Russians will do everything possible to keep the Armenian population in Karabakh and possibly to bring some other powers, at least some international observers like French probably, because Americans would bring a lot of headache to Iranians. Uh, so we'll see. Good. Not good. Headache, it will bring a lot of uh, concerns to the, to, to the Iranians, some headaches, of course. A Thanks. <laughs> Would Nona or Anita also comment on that question of Armenians finding themselves now in in, in the Azerbaijani control regions? Uh, I, I I just want to, to say is there echo or is it okay? Yeah, it's okay now. Now it's okay. Okay. So no, I I I'm actually wondering what who who what what kind of Armenians where Armenians actually stay in Azerbaijani controlled territory because uh, the Azerbaijani controlled territory is actually uh, going from Shusha and downwards so on the southern parts of uh, of Shusha and so Hadrut and so the other territories actually the northern parts of the the former Tao uh, actually are controlled still remain under the control of Armenia with uh, the the Russian troops on the ground and so the, that st the status of that of that part is actually not yet uh, understood completely. What can so what will be of this of these territories and of these people? And as I understand, uh, there's been uh, a true effort on the on behalf of um, of Armenian authorities and so because of the Russians, I guess Russia pressuring to actually bring back uh, most people the the, the most people who actually left uh, during the war to bring them back in uh, in Karabakh, in those territories where the Russian troops are, 
to sort of justify the presence of, of the Russian troops, otherwise they would be, their presence would be irrelevant, right? Um, but it is, of course, a, a huge security issue, as, as uh, it was mentioned already there a few days, uh, actually yesterday there were skirmishes in, in Adrut, uh, in, in those um, small uh, parts of territory that remain under Armenian control, and it will, of course, all depend on, on the capacity of the Russian forces to actually um, uh, protect the, the population. And yeah, so that's my <laughs> take. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Well, I think it will be time for us to stop here, unfortunately, but I hope that after the winter, winter break, we will be able to continue discussing that issue because it will stay, of course, on the agenda, both for what is happening in the region and, and uh, in the kind of the more great power uh, game. So I wanted to thank the four of you for coming together and being able to have this scholarly approach and discussing uh, your own knowledge of the region while at the same time being also very, of course, uh, emotionally or personally involved. I think it's a great example on, on, on how scholarship is helping uh, bringing different perspectives together. So once again, thank you to the four of you. Thank you to all our participants and wishing a nice end of the semester to uh, uh, everybody and hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.